What are some tips that you can offer myself and the After Hours entrepreneurs out there to make sure that our messaging is consistent? That's a really great question. First up, um, think about every line that you write has one job, and that is to get the reader to read the next line. The second thing that, um, think about the whole process, how you want to move them from creating a connection with them to conversion. Don't just end with conversion. You also then t- go back to convert a connection. It's about helping your prospect make an informed decision that they would feel good about. That's what copywriting is all about. Creating a connection that matters, using words that matter and make money. That's how I describe copywriting. Today we are joined by copywriting experts, entrepreneurs, very excited to chat with Prerna and Mayank from contentbistro.com. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Mark, for inviting us. We're really excited about being here and chatting with you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Copywriting, content creation is something I'm very, very passionate about. Y'all are having some incredible success. I want to start by asking you a definition before we get started in the episode today, because something that comes up a lot on your website is the term intentional profitability. What does that mean to y'all? Absolutely. Um, So intentional profitability for us is a, a way of life. It's a way of being. It's a, something that defines not just um, not just who we are, but also how we make our decisions. It's something that, in fact, um, Mike will be able to speak more to this, but that we came up with when we realized that we want to build this business um, in a way that it integrates with our life and not the other way around. And we want to build it for the long term. So we're not in this for the quote unquote, the overnight success or the flash in the pan or, you know, um, the, the six figures in six days kind of thing. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've been at this for a while and we want to be very intentional about the way we build our business, the programs we launch, the services we offer, the clients we work with. So all of it ties into our, um, our overall profitability because at the end of the day, it's not about um, it's not just about the the big numbers. Uh, yeah, sure, we have a um, a multi six figure business, but the fact is that we we also have a very high profit margin. Yeah, absolutely. And and the couple of things that we've always sort of focused on, um, and and those uh, come from the inherent values that we have, is that we don't do debt. So we've never done mm-hmm. debt for our business. And and like Prina said, um, we. We like uh, to function on a really high profit margin, so we make our decisions accordingly, and that's why we built a pretty lean team. Uh, But a high profit margin is very, very important to intentional profitability. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the cool things about business in 2021 and beyond is it's very possible to stay lean. You're seeing these massive media productions like the Joe Rogan show, which just has a skeleton crew competing against these major platforms. So one of the things that I've been big on is virtual assistance and and recreating that process. Um, And I've noted that it's a very competitive market. There's people from all over the world. I'm curious, are you implementing virtual assistants into your business model to kind of help with the back end processes or how did that scale up for you? Yeah, absolutely. So we, uh, like Mike said, we have a lean team, a small but mighty team. They've worked really, really <laughs> well. Our team is in fact based on, um, you know, over the globe. And as we speak, uh, we have our editor and our social media manager who are in Canada. In fact, uh, we recently onboarded a new team member who would help us with a lot of the research analysis that we do for our um, copywriting and consulting projects. And she's based in Canada as well. Our designer is based in India, but in a different state. One of our VAs uh, who manages admin and, uh, you know, a lot of the calendar management um she's based in the in the philippines so um mm-hmm. so yeah we've you know built um a virtual global team yeah but but the one thing we've sort of focused on uh, with the team is uh, to look at uh, people who specialize um in in what they do and are really good at mm-hmm. so so that's why we have uh, two virtual assistants mm-hmm. uh one of them's really good with research the other one does uh, inbox management and a, a lot of other stuff. Um, then we have uh, in-house editor, so she only does editing and nothing else. 
um, for social media, we've got somebody else. So everybody sort of specializes in their role and does a great job of it. And I think that's definitely been a learning curve for me in, in growing the After Hours Entrepreneur and the media company over here is, you know, finding the right people for the right job. It can sometimes yeah. be easy when you're starting off to try to fit a, a, a square peg through a circle hole and it doesn't always fit. Yeah. So find the right people for the right job. So we got, a, we got a little bit ahead of ourselves. I want to go back a little bit because one of the dreams of the After Hours Entrepreneur is to quit their day job and go full time with their passion, with their side hustle. I just kind of want to go back in time with Content Bistro and tell us, how was this business born? You say you didn't take out a lot of debt. How did we start? Yeah, so um, it is, um, it's an interesting story for sure. Uh, both of us come from corporate job backgrounds. So yes, I'm sure your audience would be able to relate to that. My uncle was uh, uh, at American Express. I was working with Dell when I, um, um, when I quit. And we sort of fell into entrepreneurship because of life circumstances. Um, what happened was uh, mine got really sick and uh, he had chronic inflammation and was on, uh, you know, and had to like, leave work because his job was extremely demanding and also was working night shifts. So um, when he uh, he quit and what happened was I quit about nine months earlier when I'd gotten pregnant with our daughter. So um, we needed to like, you know, our first priority was, of course, helping him heal and get better. But um, and that also happened because, you know, um, I'd started blogging as a part time thing when just as a creative outlet when our daughter was born and I was at home and I really needed like, you know, some form of like creativity and like an outlet to just kind of talk and share. And then when he started getting better, we realized that we want to go ahead and, you know, um, maybe give the part-time blogging thing a more full-time spin. And this was his idea because he's always had an entrepreneurial bent of mind. I've always been the kind who's been like, let's just settle for the security of a paycheck. So, um, but he was like, let's, you know, let's give this a shot and see if we can turn this because the whole idea of being an entrepreneur, and I'm sure Mark, you can relate to this, is like we wanted more time with our daughter who was, you know, um, at that time she was like a couple of years old. Yeah, three years old. Three yeah. years old, yeah, <laughs> and you know, we, and his job, because it, it was like he used to work night shifts, it was extremely demanding, he used to hardly get to spend time with her. And um, when he started getting better, he was like, you know, let's try this for a year and see if we can make it work. And, um, and yeah. Now, I'm, I'm just curious, Pier Perna, during this time where he's getting better, you've been blogging as more of a hobby, were you already starting to see revenue from the blog at that time? Not really, no. It was extremely okay. part time. Uh, it was rev. It was you wouldn't call it revenue because it was just like I think a couple of hundred dollars or so, or uh, maybe yes. even less than that. Because yes. those were like you know very part time. Like fellow bloggers would reach out and say, "Hey, uh, would you you know you've written really, really great posts? Would you write for me as well?" And you know the pay wasn't really great, but it was a great opportunity for me to kind of learn how the blogging world works and write better and learn and grow and so. It wasn't really a revenue, I would say like a profit generating business by any chance, but it was, it was definitely something that at least he felt that had potential. What did you see, Mayank, that said, we've got something here, maybe we should start leading into the blogging and the copywriting more? What, what was it that you saw? So like, like Prina said, in, in the first year, uh, revenue wasn't great. In fact, uh, at the end of first year, we've made just $21,000. So that's not a lot of money. Um, but we did see um, a, a lot of people wanting to pay for content, for social media. And the other thing was that we saw this integrating really well with our life. So we used to look forward to Mondays. We were really enjoying what we were doing. Uh, we had lots more time uh, at our hand. We, we could travel more. And that sort of also helped uh, with uh, with our lifestyle, and that's what sort of helped me get better. So, uh, so really, from there, uh, after the first year, we built on those uh, strengths, and then uh, that's when we started seeing the revenue flow in. Gotcha, gotcha. So you were starting to see these breadcrumbs, but you're seeing yeah. a lot of positives, a lot of things that, and I I empathize with this a lot as well as an after hours entrepreneur. I'm trying to 
just give myself the options in the future so that if I want to go to the beach with my daughter on a Wednesday, I can do that. You know, we can do that. But yeah. if you're if you're a slave to a big corporate job, you, you don't necessarily have that opportunity. Um, so when you decided to give it more attention, what was we've already talked about some of these breadcrumbs that we've seen along the way. Right. What was like the biggest hurdle? You were like, there's no way this is going to work. But like, I know that you had to run into some hurdles that you had to overcome in mm -hmm. making this successful business happen. What was that first big hurdle that you had to overcome? I think one of the big ones for us was that uh, we'd eaten away all our savings um, for the year that mm -hmm. I wasn't working and we, we had huge hospital bills um, and that was pretty early in our life. So we didn't really have lots uh, of savings at our hand. Uh, so that was one of the big challenges. We were in no position to invest in our business. So um, to build our skills, we would basically look at free resources. We didn't really have the money to invest in courses or to take any coaching and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, at the other end of the spectrum, we didn't even have money to build a website. Mm -hmm. So so I think that was like one of the biggest challenges that we had. Um, and pretty early on, we thought that uh, the, the ethos that we we're gonna work with is to give great value and results. So, so we said, let's under promise and over deliver and build a brand. And then we could obviously get to a place where we could invest back in the business. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's very kind of like standard for the par as an entrepreneur You're trying to build something, things are going to be really tight. And I mean, I struggle with that trying to go through that process with my wife trying to explain hey you know we're not making a lot of money now but look we're seeing this we're seeing that happen did that ever cause friction as a husband and wife trying to build this business because i mean we don't really need to get too personal but that's something that i find fascinating about husband and wife working together was there ever a tension about money or were you all on the same page as you started to build this together we were definitely on the same page, um, you know, as we were starting to build this together as far as money goes. We've also, in fact, always worked together, even in corporate. That's how we met. Like we were working together in corporate. Um, so, so yeah, no. Um, and also like our shared value system, like mine said, we were always very clear. We didn't want to do that. We were okay with taking it slow. We were okay with bootstrapping it. And, you know, how you mentioned, like we, we didn't even have enough money to hire someone to build a website uh, for us. Like when we started the blog, uh, the business, it was called Social Media Direct. My mom blog was called The Mom Writes, very imaginative. Um, but, um, it was, you know, I set it up all myself and I, you know, I learned how to migrate it to Bluehost and all that fun stuff. But with the business website, we actually reached out to someone, um, you know, a former boss and asked him if he could help us because he had an ad agency and he was kind enough to do it pro bono for us. So um, mm -hmm. as far as working together in all of those things, yeah, it was it, it, there was no friction as far as, you know, anything about money or investing or all of those things. When it, our roles were clearly defined, I was the creative mm -hmm. and um, he was in charge of managing the growth and uh, finance side of things. So um, so that was very uh, that was fairly easy for us to do. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And one of the things that y'all have done really well in your business is getting recommendations. This, this is something that I think is is both really important and really difficult when you're trying to grow your business quickly is getting those testimonials. Mm -hmm. At this point, you've been recommended by Pat Flynn, big, big time dude, and by Forbes. Tell me, how do you go about getting these types of endorsements from these well-recognized and respected institutions? Well, um, like Mike said, our focus right from the start was being very results results driven for our clients. So whether it was social media and then later on we pivoted into copywriting, our focus has always been to give our clients the not just like a really great experience, but also results that they can tie into their business goals, their marketing goals, which is why we're all about, you know, being an ROI focused business, whether it's for consulting or copywriting. Um, for, uh, for Pat Flynn, I've uh, done multiple projects with him on, uh, for, for a lot of his programs and evergreen funnels. And, um, he was really, really liked the process that followed the attention to detail. So, you know, that naturally brought about uh, an endorsement uh, from him, a testimonial from him. He's, uh, you know, also gone ahead and recommended us to uh, quite a few people who ended up working with us. Um, with Forbes, it was again, um, you know, they um, we had we just in fact had our um, a complete feature done on how we look at um, positioning our offers and how we, you know, create um, irresistible offers that end up like selling really fast by just kind of 
a few strategies that we've tested out over and over again with our offers. So it's, I feel it just kind of come to, all ties into uh, thinking about the clients you're serving and also what kind of results will they get um, from the work you're doing. They all need to be very tangible and they need to tie in to their overall marketing goals. How, I'm curious, how did you actually get that first job with Pat? Because obviously we understand, you know, delivering that amazing experience, but sometimes it's getting that foot in the door. How did you get your foot in the door with Pat? I reached out to him. Um, I pitched him on, um, on Instagram, no less. <laughs> <laughs> so, so an Instagram DM or were you commenting in his, in his posts or how did, how did you get him there? Um, it was an Instagram DM. However, it would be unfair uh, for me to say that it was just an Instagram DM. Um, <laughs> we had a relationship with Pat that goes way back. We He was one of the first people we started following uh, when we started our business. So, uh, you know, he would, he's always been great with recommending products that are fantastic. In fact, we ended up buying like a few of the products he recommended, like the like blue host for that matter or um you know it was an sto tool so we had we, we were on his on his list we also uh signed up for one of his programs which was um for, on affiliate marketing because that was something we wanted to learn more about so it's not like we didn't know him um also um you know um we uh, i attended a, a quite a few events that he was speaking at and had a chance to meet him in person. So what we do is we try, we fly out to the US when travel was um, a thing. <laughs> <laughs> we go to the US, uh, you know, travel to events very regularly. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I had the opportunity to meet Pat in person um, and uh, interact with him at a few of those events. So it's not like he didn't know us at all, he yeah. did. But, um, but there was no like, you know, you need to then kind of also believe in yourself and also see the kind of value that you need to, you will be able to bring to um, an entrepreneur, whether they're like an industry leader or, an, you know, or someone who's just getting started. You, as a service provider, you need to be really clear about how is it that you're going to be able to help them. And then with that in mind, then, you know, um, we reached out to him on Instagram and asked him if there was, you know, if he would need this kind of support. And he was like, yeah, let's get on call and talk about it. And, and yeah. Well, yeah. I love that. I definitely think living and being where these people are at is important because it's, it's in my experience, it's pretty rare that just one random DM is going to get someone's attention. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. you know, if you're contenting, if you're commenting on their Instagram or if you've joined their private community or if you're following them on YouTube, you know, you keep showing up, you know, it's, it's amazing what can happen. So I want to talk a little bit about more um, tactically about the the value proposition of Content Bistro, okay? Uh, we've talked a lot about being results-oriented, ROI-oriented. Can you talk to me a little bit about what your offering is? Who are you? Who is your product for? Who is your service for? And what are the results that you expect to get for these clients? Sure. So um, we have both copywriting and consulting services. So our conversion copywriting services are tailored specifically for coaches, course creators, and consultants who want to see consistent sales while being able to connect with their audiences in a way that feels really good to them and is aligned with who they are and their value system. Like for us, our value system is key and we love working with entrepreneurs who have great offers that have, you know, that are aligned with their value systems and with the tangible results. The consulting side of our business is uh, for service providers like ourselves who, um, who want to scale, but in a way that's sustainable and that ties in the whole idea of intentional profitability uh, so that they can integrate their business and their life in a, you know, in a way that it doesn't like kind of blow up um, in their face. Yeah. And what, one of the things that we normally do, uh, whether it's for a copywriting projects or consulting is, is when, when we're about to kickstart the project, we take a very specific goal mm -hmm. uh, that, that the client's looking for so uh, it could vary from maybe wanting one sale a day uh, to to expecting say fifty thousand to hundred thousand uh, dollars coming through this launch. So with that key specific goal, uh, then we sort of tailor our strategy and and try and see if we can nail that for them. 
Yeah. And even though we that, I'm just curious. Sorry. I'm curious. I just want to go a little bit deeper on that, Mayank. Is that something that you had a lot of experience with before you launched Content Bistro? Or is that, are these some things that you've learned over time? Because I would imagine if someone says, hey, I want 10,000 downloads, it'd be hard to quantify that when you're first starting out. How did we get yeah. to this point? So we, we obviously uh, saw a lot of stuff that worked in, in our content and social media business mm -hmm. before we pivoted into copywriting. And uh, when we did a move into copywriting, we did invest a lot in um, in skill building. So uh, Prina uh, is certified uh, by Joanna Weeb. Uh, so she's one of the few certified copywriters. So uh, when we started working with clients, we did have um, that, that amount of confidence and also uh, had gone deep into copywriting to know what's possible and what's not. So, so it's a bit of both, seeing what's happened before with our content and social media business and being prepared and with a lot of skill building so, so as to know what, what can you actually promise. Absolutely. And you, we don't usually go ahead and like say guarantee results or promise that you're going to get there. But we also want to know where our clients are coming from and what does success look like for, to them uh, when they work with us. And then it is our goal to tailor the strategy, whether it's for their launch or for scaling their business. Like we've got our, uh, we've got a program called Momentum Mise en Place, where we work with entrepreneurs who want to scale their business without the stress, who want distraction-free growth. And uh, we work closely with them. And one of the things we look at is and we tailor our, you know, the growth plans we create for them specifically for where they are in business, for their season of life. Um, and then, of course, it's a lot of, you know, like testing and optimizing in everything, whether it's copywriting or consulting. It's all about kind of seeing, you know, what's working and what's not. But um, we've been able to take the skills we've learned and the, um, and the experience that we have, because as entrepreneurs ourselves, we are our best guinea pigs, right? So you, we go ahead and test a lot of the things on our business first. Um, in fact, before we can suggest it to a client and say, hey, go ahead and try this. Um, so we do a lot of that for our programs, for our um, for our business, which is why when we work with service providers um, and in our programs, whether it's Profits on Tap or Momentum Muso Plus, we ensure that everything we share with them has been, you know, tested out. And we know that it would, you know, it would bring uh, results. It, 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 like every experiment and it varies depending on other conditions, but it is our goal to know what is it that our clients would want from us um, and what does success look like to them when working with us so that we can do our best to make it happen. You're not just going in blind. Yeah, well, I think those are all very, very reasonable things. I, if there's one thing I hate, it's over promising and under delivering. So oh, I yeah. like the idea of, of, of being able to show, hey, this is the experience that we've had. This is based yeah. on your need. This is what we feel confident we can execute on. But I'm, I'm kind of curious. Another thing that I'm just kind of thinking selfishly here while I've got the experts on the on the line, I want to ask the experts here. One of the things I've been really focused on here over the coming or over the past several months is improving my hooks, better hooks, getting people engaged and um invested in what they're about to read. Um, but one of the things that I feel like I sometimes struggle with is, is keeping that messaging consistent from the hook all the way down to your final offer. What are some tips that you can offer myself and the After Hours entrepreneurs out there to make sure that our messaging is consistent throughout the, the hook all the way to the, the time where someone presses purchase? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really great question. And also something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. So you're not, not the only <laughs> one, that are, you know, facing this dilemma, but it's great that you're already kind of thinking about it. Um, so here, a couple of things that you could do. First up, um, think about every, like every line that you write has one job and that is to get the reader to read the next line. So if it's not kind of tied into that, you need to, yeah. You need to kill those darlings. Sometimes we write something that we're really attached to and we feel, no, this is really good. Maybe just kind of take it off the page for now if it doesn't serve the purpose of getting them to read the next line and keep it for maybe a social media post that you could use later. Um, the second thing that um, as far as, you know, like in, could people getting people to stay on the page and go from, you know, the, the headline to the call to action is to 
think about, um, and this is something that I use a lot. It's in fact, my proprietary framework for copywriting called the connection conversion framework is to think about the whole process, how you want to move them from creating a connection with them to conversion. So the framework essentially that, that I use is called connection conversion. We start with connection where we start by establishing a relationship with them, start by telling them, you know, why do we care about them? And then we move them through validation. Validation is like what their past experiences, what is it that they've gone through and let them know that, hey, I understand that. Then comes education. Education is where you show them what it is that you're bringing to the table. So if it's your sales page, like say for an offer, what we've done in the past is share our process and use that process. So let's say you've got like everyone these days has now a five step framework or a three step framework, but don't just call it a framework and let it stay there. Show them how it ties into the goals they want to accomplish. Show them how it helps them overcome those limitations that their past experiences may have placed on them. So if you've got, or if even if you don't have a framework, maybe you're teaching them a course and it's got five modules. Don't just say that, oh, you get, you know, like this module is, you know, call this and this is what to educate them on how those modules will help them accomplish those goals. And then you've got conversion where you move them to conversion. Though that's where you things like your social proof, your guarantees, your credibility, all of those things kind of come into play. But the beauty of this is that you don't just end with conversion, you also then t go back to convert a connection. So you always want to close with, say, a personal message. You want to close your page with something like, say, um, maybe help them make a decision by showing them what, what are their options. You know, connection isn't just, oh, I understand you, I get you, I've been where you are, or you know, the same story. Connection is like just is treating your prospect like a person who you care about. It's about helping your prospect make an informed decision that they would feel good about. That's what copywriting is all about. It's about, you know, like creating a connection that that lasts, creating a connection that matters, using words that matter and make money. That's how I describe copywriting is you use words that matter and make money. So you end with connection as well. So when you're looking at a sales page or an email for that matter, you know, you. That's why this framework that um, we created for, for our copywriting, you know, um, projects is so powerful because you start with connection, you end with connection. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the other thing that's, that's really important and that's part of our process is to understand that if you're speaking the sort of language that your prospect really understands and it, it connects with them, and that really comes with a lot of research. Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of our copywriting process. So I, are you running a lot of surveys? Um, I, are you understanding what the pain points really are? Um, it could also be uh, with, with getting on short calls, uh, say 20, 30 minute calls with, with your audience with, without pitching anything. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you really get the sort of messaging uh, that's gonna connect uh, with your audience. So, so research is a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. I had another great tip that was re relayed to me by uh, Tara Zerker a few few months ago mm -hmm. in where she said, hey, go to Amazon and read reviews for products and services that are in a similar niche. You can Absolutely. really get a feeling for pain points. Yeah, 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 yeah. And when you're reading those reviews, like don't just focus on the, the one star and the two star ones, like look at the three star reviews because those would give you like what's good about a product and what was missing in a product. Because sometimes what happens is like people just focus on one star and two star reviews. So in fact, like mine's absolutely right. Research is a big part and our research is like research process when we're doing, you know, projects with clients is, is really intense. It involves exactly what you said. It involves like, obviously, you know, looking at Amazon and Quora and other forums for an industry, but we also get on calls with, you know, our clients' clients. We help them create surveys because not all surveys are created equal and wouldn't give you the kind of results. In fact, that's one of the things that I uh, did with Pat Flynn as well is create a survey for his team that helped them get really great messaging inside that they could then use in um, um, in an upcoming project. So, um, so research forms the backbone of every word that you would put on a page. It needs to guide um, the direction and the messaging that you would have. And that's what kind of then makes it all just so readable and so easy for a prospect to kind of engage with and then go ahead and make an informed decision. 
Fantastic, fantastic stuff. We are, of course, chatting with Mayank and Prerna from Content Bistro, contentbistro.com. You can get the whole backstage pass to everything that they're doing over there. Listen, before I let y'all go, I would be remiss if we didn't get into the rapid fire. So if you've got a couple more minutes, are you ready for the rapid fire? Are we all set? Absolutely. All right. So let's lock and load. What is a must-have business-related item that costs less than $50? I would say for us, it has, it's a tool. Um, it's uh, called Loom. It's great for recording videos, video messages, for adding more personalization and also giving great feedback. We talked about bringing on virtual assistants. It's great for onboarding your assistants as well. You can create like short videos and it, I, I don't know, like the paid version is like five bucks or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm big on video messaging, so I love Loom. I'm, I'm with you on that. What is a must-have subscription in your life right now? Teachable or Notion? <laughs> I, I'd say Notion because uh, we, we love uh, project management and planning 90 days at a time. So that really helps us uh, keeping, um, keeping us really focused with, with our goals and um, – and we, uh, Notion right now, we're on the free plan, so you don't even have to uh, pay for it. Yeah, so it's not even a subscription, actually. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's a really, really cool tool. Uh, we use it for, for client portals. We use it for our own project management. We use it for our own company guidebook. You know, like all everything lives in Notion. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Uh, if you could only have one social media app on your phone, what would you have? <laughs> It, it would be Instagram for me at the moment. Yeah. For us, Instagram is yeah, yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. And then final question, I'll let y'all both give your, your answer to this here. If you had 10 seconds with yourself 10 years ago, what would you say? Ooh. <laughs> 10 seconds with our, with our younger self 10 years ago. Okay. That's a cool one. Um, <laughs> let's just go, go with your gut. Yeah, I I'd probably say what what we said ten years ago. Just just give it a shot and not worry about anything. Yeah, bet on yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Go with your gut. Bet on yourself. The content bistro team, Prerna and Mayek said it. And I agree with it. Thanks for joining the show, y'all. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Mark. I'm glad you enjoyed this episode. I've got several other episodes right here for you. Smash one of these videos to make sure that you don't miss out on the tips, tools, and tactics of industry experts. Let's take that side hustle full time. Smash one of these links.